Welcome to 1991 Movie Rewind, the podcast where we watch and review every movie released in 1991, from the all-time greatest classics to the critically panned and everything in between. We will rediscover forgotten fan favorites and uncover hidden gems as we explore the depths of direct video Join us in our celebration of the fun, unique, and diverse films of this highly underrated year. This week, we watched Enchanted April. <laughs> Enchanted April takes place in 1920s London. Lottie, played by Josie Lawrence, is a housewife stuck in a loveless marriage who is desperate to get away. In the newspaper, she spots an ad about renting a castle in Italy. Though she can't afford it herself, she convinces her new friend Rose, played by Miranda Richardson, and two other women to chip in for a month-long vacation they hope to never forget. Screenplay by Peter Barnes, directed by Mike Newell, and premiered at the BFI Film Festival, on November 6th, 1991. Have you seen Enchanted April before? No, I thought I did. I got this movie mixed up with another movie, mainly because of the cover, and I thought it was um, that Helena Bonham Carter movie, like Room with a View, or... Something like that. Something like that. (laughs) I thought that was that. Yeah, because the... uh, I definitely know the cover from working at a video store. It looks like a 1920s novel, the way it's like sort of sketched out. Yeah, a period piece. I I saw that movie. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) The Helena Bono Carter movie. Not this one. Not this one. This is... Yeah, you you mistakenly thought that Polly Walker... Was Lisa Helena Bonham Carter. Yeah, Helena Bonham Carter. Uh, so no, I didn't. Um, yeah, I have never seen it either. Again, it's just another... Period piece. Another period you... piece that just does not typically interest me too much, I'm afraid. And uh, skipped on by it. <clears throat> when I, got I mean, when I was younger, I didn't really care. But now I like, I like a lot of period pieces. I think it kind of depends, and a lot of it will have to do with like where it is located, and I'd probably be more interested in the scenery and just seeing, you know, the European landscapes, for instance, in this mm-hmm. particular movie, as opposed to the costumes or anything else. Like, that's that's really what I'd be interested in, and, like, the period pieces tend to have less of the city stuff and more of the country stuff. And so I'd be looking yeah. more at the, the nature. And this movie didn't have a lot of that. I was expecting more Italian vistas. I don't know. Like, I, I was expecting... Yeah. You they know, just stayed on the premises of that castle. Yeah, there's like a couple small areas where they have, you know, foliage and, and garden type stuff and a couple trees. And when they first arrive, they have a couple of shots looking out onto, like, this massive lake. But it's not well, really I that pretty because it's, like, all water. And you don't really get to see anything. As I don't know. Just is that water. the lake or is that the actual, like, Mediterranean Sea? I don't know. I mean, there's land on the other side. That's why I assumed it was oh, a lake. Oh, okay. Because <laughs> I know this castle, it, I mean, the castle that they stay at is the actual castle that the author the author stayed at at and wrote about and um it's called castello brown in portofino italy which is like right at the edge um of the northern part of italy okay where it like curves up there and then you know you it's right on the ocean so yeah it's probably ocean and i just saw land on the other side i mean yeah it could be just like you know it looked more enclosed than it probably was yeah um yeah we should say it was based off of a novel by elizabeth von arman um who wrote it back in the 20s i believe yeah um i didn't write down that exact date And there was a previous film version of this story that was released back in 1935, which I don't think is available to watch anywhere. 
so we didn't compare the two. But uh, I mean, this version doesn't modernize things in any way. You know, it's still taking place in 1920s. You know, a little bit after World War One takes place because they talk a lot about World War One and, and widowing and things yeah, they like talk that. about that it's a lot. Mentioned a lot. <laughs> And none of the, well, three of the four are not widows. Um, well, technically four of the four are not. The Caroline, her boyfriend or fiancé, was killed in the war, but they were mm. not married. Mm -hmm. So, um, but there's a lot of assumptions from various different yeah, people everyone that they just... are going to be widows because they're going on yeah, vacation. Yeah, it's for... Without. Single women. They they all think that they're just single women that have been widowed. Since their husbands are not accompanying them. Yes. So, um, yeah, there's a lot of assumptions of that throughout the entire movie. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, yeah, the, the story basically starts with a tiny bit of stock footage just to kind of set the scene, you know, showing what... London looked like at the time basically is like you know old yeah. newsreel type footage from early film history um, and then Lottie's on a bus very crowded you know dreary drizzly London day and while she's on the bus she sees that ad that some, in the newspaper that someone's holding up that mentions about the Italian yeah castle. to those who appreciate wisteria and sunshine yeah she's drawn to that ad yeah it, it triggers something in her brain and then she immediately goes to like this woman's club that I I don't I guess she's a member of. I don't yeah, I was really know. I was wondering what that was about. <laughs> not, I, I don't really know because she immediately goes and zeroes in on this woman named Rose um, Arbuthnot. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it seems like they don't really know each other that they've never talked to each other before. No, but I think. Yeah, Lottie is just like you look. I've seen you, you always in look sad. Yeah, I see and she's you. She's like that's just my face. <laughs> that's just my face. I should say. That's just my face. Yeah. Um, but I mean, everyone in the in the movie just thinks. I mean, she is a sad woman. Yeah, she is. She is unhappy. Both of them are unhappy. Um, yeah, she just hones in on her. She's like. Uh, um, and I think, honestly, the fact that it was made for TV explains a lot about how it was shot. Because, you know, when we first started watching this, I paused it a couple minutes in. And I'm like, is there something wrong with the picture? Yeah. I, I, we were watching on Pluto TV, because that's the only free streaming service it's available on. And everything is just extremely close up. I thought the entire thing was zoomed in by the streaming service. And... The answer is no, it's not. That's just how it's shot. And I think there's two reasons for that. One is it was made for TV, which means that typically the framing is going to be a lot closer than what you would see in a theatrical thing because the screens are smaller typically as to where the end result is going to be. So you want the faces to be bigger and more readable to somebody who's watching on a 13-inch screen, which is, you know, more common at that time, right? Um, and then I think the other part of it is that because it is... A TV movie which probably had a very low budget aside from the cast because they got a really good cast <laughs> in yeah. this. Um, I think they wanted to zoom in as much as possible to show that they did not dress the streets or other people on the streets or you know in the scenes for this period piece you know only costume the main people who are in the scene and then zoom in on them you don't have to dress the background if everything is punched in real close. So I think that was probably part of the reason why that was done, but it was very off-putting. Uh, and there's a lot of extreme close-ups, which do not seem to fit. Like, they're just having normal conversations, and then there's a cutaway line of, you know, the middle of the forehead to the chin of someone mm -hmm. responding with a line. It's like, whoa, back off. So... Anyway, we have our four. It takes a little bit of time. I mean, that's like basically the first act is getting these people together. Mm -hmm. um, meanwhile, there's a, a quick little scene where 
as Rose is about, I'm sorry, as, as um, Lottie is about ready to, to leave, Malersh surprises her and says that he wants to take her to Italy on a trip for her birthday, I think it is? For Easter. For Easter. Um, Which, I mean, they want to go in April, and I'm like, well, I mean... Depending on the year. Depending on the year, <laughs> uh, Easter is either in March or April. But yep. then she was... Well, okay, he's like, I want to talk to you, and she's like, I want to talk to you. Before This is like right before she leaves. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like she's... I mean, I think that they started looking for people maybe this was like in february they were starting to plan this i don't know they don't that's what give i timelines. kind of thought it was i thought i saw maybe february. the newspaper says it yeah, yeah. yeah it could be somewhere in there so like in a couple of months you know she was like i finally have to tell him that i'm going to yeah. italy yeah without him <laughs> yeah <laughs> And so, yeah, he springs that surprise on her, and then she sort of turns it back on him and says, well, actually, I'm going with my friend to Italy to this castle that she owns, which mm -hmm. is a lie. They're renting yeah. it from this other guy named George Briggs. Um, and she's going without him. It's like a you know, girl's trip or whatever. I don't know if she says how many people are going or whatever, but basically that he can't come. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um and it's already set in stone and you know that's that's like the first time that she like stands up for herself really and yeah and i was like hoping well not hoping i thought there would be like more conflict in this movie they set up a lot of instances where there should be conflict like i thought there was going to be some drama yeah like a back and forth where and he was just kind of like oh okay well, yeah, I mean, the scene just kind of like, ends before we even yeah, see them it just, have a conversation about Yeah, the scene ends where it's just her and Rose going to Italy. Like, yeah. like what happened there? <laughs> like, was he mad? No idea. Um, we know like, that... Like, he just kind of makes a face, like, oh. And then, it's next like, scene. You can't do this, this is, you know, you yeah. can't do this without me and whatever. And the next scene, she's on the boat. Um, meanwhile, we know that Rose's husband doesn't care. He's like, yeah, she I just think that's goes. a great idea. You should go. Yeah. <laughs> because that allows him to be Gerald without any sort of With her consequence of her at home. Whatever. Yeah. Um, reprimanding him or, you know, being ashamed or whatever. <clears throat> so he's like, yeah, get out of here. That's cool. <laughs> um, so, so they get there. They have a long journey, because I was like, okay, this is the 1920s. They had to take, like... They took a boat. That boat, and they probably had to go to France, and then they had to take a train from France all the way down to Italy. I was like, that trip alone, getting there, is, like, what? Almost a week? <laughs> well, I mean, they showed them getting... <laughs> Didn't they show them getting off the boat and then they were greeted by... Well, they thought oh, they were being robbed. A couple of days, I guess. Yeah, I mean, they thought they were being robbed. <clears throat> yeah, but it was in, just the... Uh, rain and yeah. then, like, their baggage is being taken by people in the rain and it was just the people who were going to bring them to where the castle was. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, they get off the boat and then... But how would they, those people in know? Car. What do you mean? The people that worked at the castle... How would they know that these were the ladies that were going to be staying there? Probably because they were the only ladies who who arrived in that okay. area on the day they're supposed to arrive. Okay. Yeah. Because uh, they were basically alone. And yeah. They said that, you know they were like four hours late or something, so those people were probably waiting a long time for these people to finally show up. Um, but yeah, but they what take if them two other car. ladies arrived four hours earlier? Who knows? I mean, the other guests <laughs> apparently were there already. But yeah, and I, I was like, how there. did they get there? Uh, but Rose and, and Lottie, who have evidently become fast friends now, mm -hmm. um, were disappointed to see that their guests were there. Yeah, because I think they wanted to set up the castle like in a special way for these two. Because I think they were the original two to come up with this idea. And they were like, oh, we want to set up this castle for our other guests. Like, pick rooms for them and blah, blah, blah. 
was that just them saying that or was that actually their intention i feel like i got the impression that they really just wanted a little bit more time oh by themselves. you thought they wanted to spend like a day together alone yeah oh i thought they actually were excited and wanted to set up the place for their other two guests mm. um, i don't know <laughs> it, it's kind of tough to get a read on these people in fact so much so that the movie sprinkles in narration of these characters and her thoughts yeah um, which I thought was really weird to do it that way. I'm sure it basically is just it's like from the book, book, yeah, you know, but that's easier to that's easier to manage in a book, right you know reading people's inner thoughts is very common mm-hmm. in word form in the movie. I'm a little surprised they didn't transition some of that information into different conversations. Like, I know that Ra- Rose probably did not want to talk about some of her insecurities to to Lottie, mm-hmm. but what if she confided more to Caroline, for instance, and had, like, this, you know, oh, I'm really afraid. Or what if she's just speaking to some of the Italian help who doesn't speak English and is just sort of speaking out loud to somebody. Like, that might I don't know. I'm not sure if it would have been better. I don't because but... there are times, I think mainly when Caroline was thinking to herself because you know she just wanted to be alone and there was like times where people would come by and in her head like you hear or there's like you know the voiceover like oh no i just wish i was alone and i wish these people would leave me alone i mean yeah and i guess maybe like part of my problem is that some of the stuff that is done in narration didn't need to be said at all like, like they could have just acted out like, oh, like I'm annoyed that you're, you're bothering me. Right, because she was already doing the acting, and we had already been told earlier in the movie, I'm here just to be alone, do not disturb me, on basically under any I mean, circumstance. She, and then it is even, because when Rose and Lottie find her, I mean, she's not like rude about it. And then, no. you know, Rose is trying to like be nice and say all this stuff, and then, you know... Caroline is not really responding and Lottie's like oh well she looks like she wants to be left alone so let's just leave her alone and then Caroline's like yeah she's right I just mm-hmm. want to, to s- I think um, Rose is just like oh why don't you have breakfast or brunch or whatever with us because we have things set up and we're going to eat together and Caroline's no I just want to you know stay out here and just be alone in the quiet Right. Which, I mean, she does say that. Mm-hmm. And she also says that she has a headache as an excuse to not. Yeah, show yeah, up, yeah. And that becomes like a thing. Yeah. And Lottie's the only one who seems to understand her actual intentions. I don't know. Yeah, just the narration was kind of off putting. And there's even this one single point where Rose looks at the camera. Mm. You know, like when she's writing the letter to her husband to get her to. Uh, to possibly have for her come like he she looks at the camera and says and i don't think i'm even gonna send this letter hmm. and i'm like why why did that just happen it doesn't make sense to me um it's just weird watching people think you know because they're <laughs> like they're kind of like overreacting and like overacting because they know there's going to be a narration over it and so they're you know exaggerating their facial expressions when it again like a lot of stuff especially some of the caroline stuff didn't need to be said because we can see it in her face we already know what her deal is yeah and even when her deal changes we don't hear that from narration because there is a point later on in the movie when people are showing up like lottie invites her husband to share in the beauty of this place and he shows up um george briggs the owner comes by to visit and see how things are going and now here's all these people around and caroline does want the attention and she's getting jealous that everyone's getting attention except for her but there's no narration to explain that Mm -hmm. but it's really obvious just because of the way she's acting Mm -hmm. (laughs) and so it kind of proves that it is not needed it was a choice (laughs) And honestly, I don't feel like we got a good enough chance to learn these characters anyway. Uh, There are a lot of little tiny scenes 
but I mean, I don't, I don't really get the, I never got the growth progression of them. Yeah, that's why I was like, this movie is just kind of like too condensed. It's right? moving. It's it's and now it makes sense that it is a TV movie. Like I'm thinking, it's kind of like how Lucy and Desi is, where it's just like, here's a scene. Okay, next scene. <laughs> I right. don't. Know. It's like here's a scene about these two having somewhat of a conflict, but then we don't see what happens after that next scene where someone's just, you know, enjoying nature and whatever, being alone, and likes to be in this castle and then it's like another scene where like mrs fisher is like she's trying to like gather everyone together she's kind of like being in charge of you know the people that work there she's always mm-hmm. like banging that gong or the bell and stuff mm-hmm. yeah like she kind of wants something like orderly yeah we, but we never really but i don't know we don't really anything understand her motivation yeah i don't yeah i don't know her I didn't know her past or like what she wanted what she, what she wanted to get from being at the castle. Right. Like why did she go? I think she honestly was, just like, her wanted intentions? friendship oh, and okay. like, was too proud to admit that she wanted friendship because she was she's like this lonely widow. Yeah, maybe. That's so, why I was like what was her cuz I mean at the end of the movie it's like uh, just get into it. it's like you know Lottie and Malersh kind of rekindle their love for each other, and then even Rose and her husband rekindle their love for each other because of this castle or whatever. Right. Yeah. It becomes like this magical place supposedly that Lottie is able to see before anyone else, and she wants to invite her husband there basically right away. Yeah. And the the other women are kind of like reluctant about it because they were like, "Isn't this what you you wanted to?" be away from him like why are you inviting him and yeah. she's just like i miss him and i yeah. want him to see this place yeah like it's it's not fair for me to hide this from him i need yeah. to be able to share this with him um i yeah, i thought her speech there was um one of the better ones in the movie and then rose is kind of like sad she's like i guess i'll invite my husband but she's kind of like he probably won't come. Yeah, I don't know if she even really wanted him to be there at all. It seemed like it was, half of her reluctance was, oh, he probably won't accept because he doesn't want to be with me. And then half of it was, well, I'm not sure if I want him to be here either. Yeah, because she Because seems she really to... did want to get away. Yeah, she... I mean, the, the parts with her, she's just kind of like laying in the grass and it seems like she's enjoying the nature and then her in the water kind of like floating and just feeling the water and like the moss like she's trying to become one with nature Mm -hmm. and i thought that was her enjoying the place but either she was like happy she was alone or sad she was alone i don't yeah because there and then there was also other parts where she was like sitting by a tree crying like Mm -hmm. she just was going through her emotions i guess yeah, and, and the narration isn't really telling us what's in our head the way it should if right. it's going to exist. Um, yeah, and, and, you know, like we talked about, I mean, it, so eventually she does invite her husband and, and he does show up after George Briggs shows up, who is the owner and also is hitting on Rose. Yeah, he's very he much interested in her. Yeah. She's a widow and available. Um,. And, and they're hitting it off, and I thought that's where some of the drama was. Yeah, going to that's. Come I was like, oh, or is this going to be the conflict? That's because I mean, the other thing that they find out is that um, her husband Frederick was like sorta like interested in Caroline. I don't know if they were an item. I don't think they were an item. No, but um, but I they think knew each said, other and like. Yeah. They knew each other because he, she knows him as Gerald, Gerald, not Frederick. Yeah. And, but they had like this, I don't know, they were flirting, I guess. I don't know. (laughs) This, it's not like an actual relationship, I guess. 
Yeah, I mean, but well, I mean, everyone flirts with Caroline, right? That's right. part of what and she's afraid what... of, and what she talks about is like, oh, everyone's gonna be like, they're hovering over me, they're gonna grab me, and all this kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. Like that's what she talks about avoiding all the time. And I think that what he had said when he arrived was true is that he went to Caroline's mother to find out where she went, and he came after her. Mm. That she that he actually did not get Rose's letter. Oh, so he was looking and for it's Caroline. Just pure coincidence and, it's, and was surprised oh, that, his that Rose wife, was there. Yeah. And then sort of played it off. Yeah. But they don't get into that drama and there definitely could have been. I, I even wrote down like, um, I really didn't think that the mouth trumpeting thing that he did when he got back home. Yeah. You know, like when Frederick comes home from being in this party, he does like these do to do's. Yeah, he's like, burp, 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 burp. Yeah, like when he's makes little frustrated or something. Or, or even happy. Yeah. It, it's just, you know, like a quirk of his character. And I thought that that was going to be the tell that, like, he was going to be with Caroline. He was going to be, like, doing these mouth trumpety things. And Rose would hear it and come and see her and him talking and whatever. You know yeah. what I mean? Um, yeah. But that didn't happen. Then... Like, it could, it was an obvious plot device that just didn't resolve. Yeah. And that, instead, it was the other way around where George walks in on Rose and Frederick, like, they start to begin, like, rekindling their relationship. Right. And they start kissing each other, and George sees this, and he's extremely surprised. And Rose is like, oh, let me introduce you to my husband. And George was like, oh, I didn't even know that you were married. I thought you were widowed. Like, how everyone else thinks she is. And then at dinner, when Caroline comes in already knowing him as only Gerald and he introduces himself like he stands up immediately and, and like says his real name over and over and over yeah, again yeah I'm Frederick Arbuthnot you know, I'm like Frederick with a wink and a nod like Caroline just goes with it it's like oh yeah got it no cool yeah we're good yeah but there was like no conflict there no yeah it, I thought there was gonna be drama at like so yeah, many points and there wasn't there wasn't I, I, but I think it was is it meant to, that's why i was like i want to read this book because i'm like is it meant to be this way <laughs> yeah it, it's really weird and honestly like the music kind of blends to that same type of like suspenseful vibe like it's supposed to be peaceful right like it's supposed to be very peaceful and tranquil but the music in this movie is also kind of like 60s horror or suspense yeah it's a, well and then it's a lot of that oboe and it's shown that um Briggs. george briggs he play he likes playing the oboe and you see him playing that so it's like tying that in somehow Maybe. but yeah i wonder if the novel has that bit of like suspense and you know like oh is this gonna happen but it doesn't yeah or maybe maybe she's playing with expectations on purpose mm. um and it's a little bit more obvious in the book than it is in the movie yeah so yeah, basically everyone is getting together and the castle is working its magic the way it's supposed to for a while. Carolyn is still unhappy because she assumed that Gerald was there for her and now she's kind of upset that she doesn't have that attention because she's starting to miss it. Yeah. Um, and she sees Malersh and Lottie, you know, rekindling things and letting this place like grow together. And mm-hmm. you know, yeah, Malersh is like, why weren't you attractive sooner <laughs> and stuff like that? Yeah, that, I mean, the, the way he talks to her, I was like, oh my god. Uh, I mean, I think he's attracted to her because of the business prospects of he, he, here's your new friends who are like high society. Like that was the initial. Like, oh, appeal. you know Caroline. Yeah. Oh, you know Caroline Dester. You know how much her family's worth. And, right. He's just you know, thinking Mrs. about Fisher is like yeah. this high powered yeah. person too. Um, so I think that was the initial draw, and then he starts to kind of get into the actual... Um, falling in love again. Yeah, yeah, going back into the falling in love thing. And then, yeah, I mean, it's near the end. Um, it's just weird. Like, all of a sudden, like, one scene, it seems like everyone starts to be more happy for the most part. You know, you see Mrs. Fisher, who was very standoffish, in a sense, you know, being more, you know... Um, receptive to Lottie's affection and, yeah you know or, yeah their friendship less less prudish in their conversations and whatnot 
Um, and there's this whole thing about Mrs. Fisher and her cane and how she needs to have her stick to walk around. And I was finally starting to walk without my stick at this place. And, you know, I, I also be very curious to know if the book is, you know, treating the castle as like a actual like, parable for heaven. Yeah. It, you know, because they talk magical... about that. Yeah. Because Lottie's like, oh, isn't this a piece of heaven? Yeah. Like, is that more literal in the book, maybe? Mm. You know, because, like, if if Mrs. Fisher no longer needs her stick to get around, you know, is it is it just a healing place emotionally? Or is she now actually maybe departed? Like cured? Or dead. And, like, they're oh. all dead together. Oh, and, you know, and, they're, and then just, they like, stay happy. there forever? <laughs> this is, like, their version of happiness. I don't know. Oh. Yeah. Just kind of thinking out loud, I guess. Okay. <laughs> like, they're all actually dead? Maybe. I don't know. Huh. I mean, in the movie, they all leave together happy. Yeah. But maybe not in the book. Oh, I don't know. I mean, yeah, at the very end, you see that, well, you know, Lottie and her husband, they're paired off. Rose and her husband are paired off. And then, like, I don't know, Caroline sees George, like, they get he's off. upset that Rose is taken (laughs) taken, and she's like oh you seem you know bothered or whatever and they start to get to know each other and then they're together and then at the very end of the movie it's like they all go for a walk like on a hike no they're all leaving down the hill oh they're all leaving oh okay okay Mm -hmm. and then that's when i thought they were all walking together along the premises or something yeah but they are to leave okay because it's the end of the month and that's when mrs fisher puts her cane like right in the middle of the dirt somewhere along that path and then you see like um flowers and a vine growing around this her cane and that's like the end of it yeah it transforms into some sort of like a small tree Mm -hmm. which relates back to a story that mr briggs told about how his um father had said we need an oleander tree here and he put like some sort of stick in the ground and that's exactly where the oleander tree had grown so it's kind of calling back to that to the okay story yeah and that's basically how it ends is we see the tree transformation and then credits so everyone's happy, I mean, basically. Yeah, I don't know how it really ends in the book, but maybe that becomes like a yearly thing for all of them because, you know, George Briggs owns that castle mm-hmm. and he's possibly going to be with Caroline right? afterwards. And this could probably be like a yearly thing for all of them to go there. Be like, hey. Yeah. It, <laughs> Every April, let's go to this castle. And they probably will do it for free now because I don't know. Because George owns it. I don't know. This is. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You'd have to read the book and report back in a future episode or something. And that won't see be for is. a while. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, that's, that's the movie. I mean, it's, it's, it's a little bit too segmented. I think we sort of got the progression but it never felt the progression it just seemed like it just suddenly happened yeah it didn't feel natural like i wanted more yeah it needed a little bit more time it needed a couple more scenes in there to really get things going but it was made for tv so they're kind of like on a yeah this is just like rushed but yeah it's it's weird and again i really wish i would have seen more of like the views like even when they were showing the castle all the shots of the castle or almost like all far of them away were far away and also dark like the castle is completely in shadow it, it's just weird how this was shot all the close-ups and everything it just everything was just weird and off-putting i mean the prettiest parts was when um rose was by herself you know, just laying on the ground and, you know, you see like this lizard crawling up sure. her body sure. and she is just not phased by it at all. She's just like enjoying nature and then her in the water just like waiting and in the ocean, I guess. 
just kind of floating and feeling the waves a little bit and the moss or whatever. Mm. I mean, I thought that was nice. Yeah, but there weren't... They didn't many... show too much of it. Yeah, there, I mean, for a movie that's about getting away and sort of relaxing and recharging, yeah, they there don't... sure was a lot of talking with very little downtime in between. Yeah, it, it mostly showed, like... I mean, it. there are parts where it shows the inside and, like, this one part where... Right when Malersh gets there, he's like, I want to take a bath. And, you know, all the people that are working there making the bath for him. Because, you know, it's like an old enchanted castle. <laughs> yeah, it's just so frantic. And everyone's talking over each other. And they're talking about how the thing's going to explode. Like the boiler above the, the tub is yeah. going to explode and everything. But everything's in Italian with no subtitles. and so Yeah, that's the other thing that kind of bothered me was all the people that worked there all the italian workers i guess were speaking to each other in italian and then all we saw was in our closed caption like speaking, speaking in it. italian <laughs> and i was like I, I really wish i knew what they were saying because there was a lot of back and forth with them yeah and it's anxiety inducing because it's like four or five people in this crowded space all yelling at each other it's like oh, this is not and I'm like, what are the, I mean, we could have, and yeah, and then it's just kind of like, I guess we're just it's probably going meant to, to be like yeah, surprising when it does explode. We're yeah, to I be. guess it's like, yeah, because we're on Malertia's side and Malertia just thinks that they want money because then he's like, here, he's giving them coins. He's like, thank you, thank you, thank you. Yeah, and they're like, oh, out. they're talking <laughs> to him, but he's just like, okay, yeah, thank you. Mm-hmm. I mean, I guess that's supposed to be like the funny there are several parts in parts. there where I think it's trying to be quasi comedic, but um, yeah, it doesn't fully land, which is fine. I mean, it's like clever humor, not really laugh out loud humor mm-hmm. type of a vibe. But uh, I mean, the movie was a decent success. It once it once it came across over the states, it made like thirteen million dollars here. Yeah, it's in the top 100 box office, which is kind of surprising. Um, and it did pretty well in the award season too. Uh, so at the 1993 Oscars, it was nominated for three different awards: uh, Best Supporting Actress for Joan Plowright, who played uh, Mrs. Fisher. Uh, she lost to Marissa Tomei. And again, these are the 1993 Oscars because the movie premiered here in 1992. Um, Adapted screenplay uh, for Peter Barnes, that lost to Howard's End, and then also Best Costume Design, Sheena Napier was nominated, but that went to Bram Stoker's Dracula instead. Uh, It did win a couple of Golden Globes, however. Uh, At the Golden Globes, Joan Plowright was the winner for Best Supporting Actress. And it also won Best Actress in Comedy or Musical for Miranda Richardson's performance as Rose. It was also nominated for the Best Comedy, but that lost to The Player. So those are the the major awards that this movie um, found itself uh, involved in there. Talking about cast and crew really quickly, I mean, there aren't that many cast members at all, which is thankful. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, so we got Mike Newell as the director. He's a, a BAFTA winner for Four Weddings and a Funeral. He is a Saturn Award nominee for Harry Pot- Potter and the Goblet of Fire. Uh, he's a Can winner for Dance with a Stranger. He's also done such movies as Donnie Brasco and Pushing Tin. And he's done a bunch of TV stuff from the mid-60s on. He's been around for a long, long time. Peter Barnes, the writer... He's Emmy nominated for Merlin. We also mentioned he was nominated for the Oscar for this. Um, Merlin is the you know the TV series in like the late '90s. Uh, he also did the Alice in Wonderland TV series in 1999 or TV movie, um, and he's also written some stuff in the, back in the day, uh, Spaghetti House, which is what this movie could have been called, I guess, maybe, because, like, you know, remember when they were oh, eating, like, yeah. spaghetti? Oh, they're always and... eating spaghetti. <laughs> I mean, and it's I an Italian like... castle, right? The yeah, well, pasta. I get it, but... Who knows what kind of offerings Italy has other. Yeah, Italy has other great food besides <laughs> spaghetti every day. But the women did not know how to eat their spaghetti properly. Oh, yeah, that, that was funny. 
Um, so yeah, he wrote a movie called Spaghetti House, and he also wrote a movie uh, starring Tony Curtis called Not With My Wife You Don't. So hey, <laughs> just a couple of fun ones there. Uh, Josie Lawrence, who played Lottie, um, I know her from Whose Line Is It Anyway? Yeah. That's probably where you know her, too, from the original British version of Whose Line, although she did appear in a couple episodes of the U.S. Um, iteration as well. IMDb only credits her as being in 37 episodes, but she's been on the show like over the course of 10 years, so that's clearly a mis mislabeling of how many episodes she's appeared on. Um, anyway, she's a British Comedy Award nominee for the Outside Edge. Uh, she's also been on TV shows such as the East Enders. And she, in 1991, she even had her own sketch comedy show for a very brief time uh, called Josie. It only lasted for six episodes, though. Miranda Richardson as Rose Arbuthnot, Oscar nominated for Damage, also for Tom and Viv, uh, Emmy nominated for Operation Orangutan as Best Outstanding Narrator, uh, BAFTA winner for Damage, and nominated for Screen 2, The Crying Game, and Tom and Viv, uh, as well as a few more items as well. Um, she was also in that Merlin show that Peter Barnes wrote, mm -hmm. uh, Big Brass Ring, uh, things like Sleepy Hollow, The Hours, and also Harry Potter. Just like most British actors have been in Harry Potter. Yeah, I was like, it's, it, I don't want to say hat, just two people from this cast are in Harry Potter. Yeah. And she also hosted SNL in, like, 93. Hmm. Huh. Um, probably because of, like, Crying Game and, like, this. Like, the back-to-back -back nature of, like, two major things and the Oscar wins and whatnot, so. Mm. Um, Alfred Molina... Af eh, excuse me. Alfred Molina played Malersh Wilkins, Lottie's husband. Emmy no nominated for The Normal Heart and also Feud. BAFTA nominated for Screen 1, Frida and Education. Spirit nominated for Love is Strange, and MTV Movie Award nominee for Best Villain in Spider-Man 2. So we know him as Doc, Doc Ock. Ock, right? Yeah, yes, Doc he's Ock. Doc Ock. <laughs> <laughs> he's, all, you know, he's been in tons of stuff as well. Um, he was Snidely Whiplash in Dudley Do-Right, that movie. I didn't... Okay. I had no idea he was like the villain in that crazy I am. I also forgot that he was British. Oh, really? Okay. Because I've seen him in so many things, and I was like, oh yeah, he's British. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> yeah, he, yeah, he's been in a whole bunch of whole bunch of stuff, like Chocolat and whatever. And he's going to be in 1991 movies, American Friends, and Not Without My Daughter. Uh, Jim Broadbent played Frederick slash Gerald. Uh, he's been in everything, it seems like. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Uh, Oscar winner for Iris, Golden Globe winner for Iris, and also for Longford, nominated for The Gathering Storm. Um, BAFTA winners as well for Longford, Moulin Rouge as well, he won for that. Nominated for Topsy Turvy, Young Visitors, The Iron Lady. Uh, he's been in things like Gangs of New York. He was the announcer on the 2015 reboot of Teletubbies. Uh, he was also huh. in Crying Game as the bartender. Uh, okay, Brazil, yeah. Time Bandits, and um, he declined the uh, title of Sir Jim Broadbent. He was offered it back in 2002 and declined. Does it say why? It does not say why. I, I did not find why. Uh, Michael Kitchen played George Briggs. He's probably the, the least accomplished of these, unfortunately, but I mean, he's still a, a well celebrated actor. BAFTA nominated for To Play the King, where he played the king. Uh, he was also in Out of Africa. He played the character Tanner in two different James Bond movies, GoldenEye and The World Is Not Enough. And he was the lead in the series Foils War, which I've never heard of, uh, but I believe it probably would have come to like PBS or something, like a British series. And then we have Dame Joan Plowright as Mrs. Fisher. Again, Oscar nominated for this, Golden Globe winner for this. Um, also an Emmy nomination and Golden Globe win for her work in Stalin. Uh, BAFTA nominee for Equus and The Entertainer, a couple of her older movies. Uh, she does a lot of family-friendly stuff, especially later in her career. She's actually now retired. Uh, Dennis the Menace, Spiderwick Chronicles, 101 Dalmatians, the 1996 version. She played the, the maid in that, or the nanny, I mean. Um, she's also done stuff like Tea with Mussolini, Surviving Picasso. Uh, and she was also 
the last wife of Laurence Olivier, who passed away in 1989, and she has been a dame since 2004, so she accepted that honor. Uh, Polly Walker is Caroline Dester, is the last one I'll mention here. She's going to be in another 1991 movie, Shogun Warrior, also known as Journey of Honor. Uh, she's also in the 1991 movies that are not on our list, Walking a Tightrope, which I think we mentioned a couple weeks back with Belle Nauzeus. Um The Michael Pickley was in that one. Mm. Uh, and then Au Film de Noit. So, uh, <laughs> I'm sure I'm mispronouncing that. <laughs> I have to I, look at how it's spelled. Uh, A O. Film D A N O I T E. You don't. Uh, you know what this is. <laughs> uh, yeah, I know Truly. that, but. <laughs> um, but she's also been in other stuff like Patriot Games. Uh, she was in Sliver. She was. Um, do you remember her in Sliver? Yeah, yeah. she was like the was like the, the neighbor. Yeah, neighbor roommate. Yeah, I know she is. Um, Eight and a Half Women, John Carter, and also more recently, she plays Lady Portia Featherington on Bridgerton. Mm-hmm. And that is all I got for casting crew. So why don't we go to true crime pop culture? Yeah, I don't have anything true crime, but um, I looked up what else was playing at the BFI London Film Festival that mm. year. And um, it had La, B- La Belle Noiseuse playing. Oh. It was My Own Private Idaho, The Indian Runner, and um, I don't know if we mentioned this, I can't remember, but en- Enchanted April was the uh, first movie Oh, played. it was the first movie played? Yeah. No, I didn't know it was that. Uh... Yeah, we'll be covering... Most, My Own Private most... Idaho. Huh, yeah. Yeah, I, yeah I, know, I know for sure that some of those are on the list, like Indian Runner and My Own Private Idaho are definitely on the list. Okay. And then, so November 6, 1991 was a Wednesday. And one historical event that happened was that the last oil fire in Kuwait this was from the Kuwaiti oil fires okay the last oil fire in Kuwait set by retreating Iraqi troops was extinguished on this day this was you know long after the Gulf War Mm -hmm. I don't know too much about no, I, <laughs> I mean, I was really young when. Yeah, it, we were like 10, just, 11 years old, and yeah. so I mean, we knew it was happening around us, but we never really got into the specifics. Like I don't, so. yeah, I don't know the specifics about it, and the only I just know jokes around it, like in Clueless, when Cher called her father to get picked up, and there was like helicopters above her Mm -hmm. and he's like where are you in kuwait Mm -hmm. like i always think of that (laughs) yeah i just i remember and i laugh even though i don't know (laughs) why well you know that she's not in kuwait right? but she also but she also says that i don't know why i'm talking about clueless but yeah she (laughs) she's like i'm in the valley or whatever and he's like everything takes 20 minutes in la so you can find yourself home or whatever I remember in the, in um, they had an unlicensed NES game where it was like Bush oh. trying to beat up or kill Saddam Hussein. Like that oh. existed around the time. So like that was part of my pop culture knowledge. Plus they had trading card sets for Operation Desert Storm and Desert Shield. They had um, tops trading cards for that. And so I knew some of the names. But yeah, I never really knew much of the specifics around. So yeah, the Kuwaiti oil fires, it started in April just to of 1991 yeah of so, 1991 yeah, so this is the this lasted all the way until november yeah almost six months yeah and i have a famous death it was uh jean tierney she died of emphysema in houston 13 days before her 71st birthday mm. She's known for being, I mean, she's an actress. She was well known for being in a lot of movies in the 30s and 40s. And I don't think I've seen any of these movies. It's a very big blind spot for me as well. She's, she was nominated for an Academy, Academy Award for Best Actress for her performance as Ellen Barrett Harland in Leave Her to Heaven. That's what she's mostly known for. She was also in Heaven Can Wait, The Razor's Edge. The Ghost and Mrs. Muir, 
Whirlpool, The Mating Season, The Left Hand of God, and Laura. And I think the only one I've seen out of all those is Laura. To TV on Wednesday nights on ABC, we had Dinosaurs, The Wonder Years, and then another TV movie. It's which is on our list, but this mm. is like a part two. It's the movie False Arrest. Okay. So it says part two of two. So the first part was maybe the week before, but I'm, I checked it on our list and I think this is going to be another three to four hour um, movie. Okay. Because it is. Because it was split. Yeah. That's interesting. Yeah. Well, we could watch it over two nights when we get there. Yeah, like we did. And then we also have, like, a TV guide, and I'm going to read, like, some of... So we probably have an ad for False Arrest we can... There is an ad There, there. is an ad in here, I think, but I don't want to look at it, because I was like, I don't want to be spoiled if we're going to watch it. Yeah, like, yeah. I, I, I just, like, went past it, and I was like, oh, I don't want to know. <laughs> <sighs> and on CBS, there was a one-hour special of Brooklyn Bridge. We spoke about this show, Wasn't, sort of. I mean, it was a comedy, and it won, like, it won the Golden Globe for Best Comedy, and then it was, like, gone in a season. Right? Um, but wasn't every episode an hour for that show? Was it? I don't I, know. Maybe I'm just assuming that because it was not, like, Because this said this was a one-hour special. S- sitcom. Yeah. You know, it's um, not taped before a studio audience, one of the few comedies back then that did that so maybe that's why i'm assuming it would be an hour just because of the format of it right i mean yeah it was two seasons oh two seasons and it had two two two-part episodes so this was one of the two-part episodes okay and i mean just to it was a american sitcom that was about a jewish family a jewish american family living in brooklyn during the 50s not and, available for streaming anywhere, which is interesting, because I'm curious to watch it, honestly. Yeah, I mean, if it's won awards and, you know, there's, like, well-known people in it. But the little blurb that's in the TV guide, it says that this, but there's even an ad for it. And it has um, Jenny Lewis in it. Mm. And um, I don't know these characters. It just says <laughs> Alan and Katie, which is Danny Gerard and Jenny Lewis, who managed to get their respective families together for dinner after Katie's father forbids them to see each other. That was this one hour episode. Sounds intense. Gotta spend an hour. It's like some Romeo and Juliet thing. Yeah. She's probably in love with someone she can't be in love with. Gotta and the those father. <laughs> yes. After Brooklyn Bridge was Jake and the Fat Man, which I think there's also an ad in here that I saw. And then um, on NBC was an episode of Unsolved Mysteries, which we watched. Mm -hmm. And we were... The way that we the episodes are online are so confusing. Yeah, IMDb and Wikipedia both have different listings for the same quote-unquote episodes, and both of them are different than what the TV Guide says happened. Yeah, so so it's very hard to find these episodes unless we had a TV Guide, which we did. Yeah, the TV Guide description corresponds with what IMDb says happened on November 1st, or, you know, like a week earlier. Yeah. Um, So, I don't know. But this episode was about you know a woman that has a case of past life regression. It's like she initially goes in to be hypnotized for weight loss, but she ends up talking about like her pat like a past life as if she was someone who was in the Navy during Pearl Harbor, yes. and, and it turns into this whole thing to see if she's like fibbing or not. Yeah, she she says that she uh, is this guy, John Gillespie, who supposedly was on Pearl Harbor, gives a whole bunch of details about stuff that had happened on the attack and people who were on the boat that she shouldn't be able to know. Yeah. Um, and there's, yeah, questions about whether or not the hypnotist, therapist, is actually, like, planting information or leading her on, whatever. Mm-hmm. Um, and there's also no proof that John Gillespie 
was on that boat. But yeah. they could find all the other people that she mentioned. Right. But not the person that she claimed to be. she was. Yeah. So, mm. unsolved. <laughs> <laughs> but i mean i know this is like early 90s and i was like couldn't they because the way that they tried to get these records um, and i was like i know this is pre-internet i was like oh they couldn't like just go online and, well, yeah, and like get some of these records well they said that part of the reason why they couldn't is that some of the records were yeah destroyed were destroyed fire. yeah um but the, i think honestly the part that was most confusing to me about that story was that they said that she went on vacation to hawaii with her hypnotherapist that and their friends. That was weird. And visited a Pearl Harbor museum. And then shortly after and that, that, that's when these things Like, she started, started to she have started these... She started to talk about John Gillespie. So, like, why go to the thing with him in the first place? That's weird to go on vacation with your therapist. And, and then, that was the weirdest... That was the mystery to me. Was And then, what? yeah, probably, like, <laughs> one of the two probably saw something about... Yeah, they probably did, like, a tour... And a, made up a story about it. Yeah. They, they probably did a, a guided tour and they got so involved in it. I don't know. And like the woman's like changing her name and is anonymous, but the therapist is there giving interviews. Yeah. And I'm sure the whole thing is his design to give himself more credibility and like, hey, give it's me more business. being a hypnotherapist. Yeah, like look what I can do for you. Because then Come she's like, over. oh yeah, and I lost 30 pounds. Yeah, and I lost 30 pounds. <laughs> so yeah, so he's, he's really guy. good. Uh-huh. Come visit my office. Mm-hmm. That's story one. Yeah, that was story one. The next one was um, a 1985 murder extortion plot that happened in Denver, and that was also really confusing to me. Yes, yeah, I mean... The, and why that happened. This guy, and Roger it, Dean, apparently possibly extorted like $30,000 from his business, and then later was murdered uh, by somebody who was looking for $30,000, and they think that Roger Dean probably set it up himself possibly because there's some clues left in the house that made it look like it was not a spontaneous event mm -hmm. um, but then years later the killer um, someone it's... posing as a killer at least uh, came back and said we're going to do bad things to your daughter if you don't give us a hundred thousand yeah his now. poor wife is being tormented by this guy and then at the end of that segment she's like we're still getting yeah. threats yeah and I felt bad for her. And there's no update. So, yeah, basically she worked with the FBI to try to get him um, caught, left the money where, yeah, the, where the killer said that she should leave the money, and he never picked it up and then claimed that she didn't follow instructions. And, and my, I, I was like, this guy is just an asshole, like, messing with her for the rest of her life for some reason. Maybe. But, um... Or it's like Roger Dean himself faking these. You know that can't be true. Cause I know. I, I was also thinking. Cause I was also thinking like, what if it was her? Because they did say that her son died in an accident. I was like, what if that was her son? Mm. You know, her paying for her husband's mistakes. Possibly. I just felt bad for her. She's gonna be. But then I was like, change your phone number, like move or something. That one was left unsolved. No updates. Yeah. And the, the only description they have of this guy was a six-foot white man who used extensive language yeah, or something. Like it has an extensive vocabulary. <laughs> and I was like, okay, so that's like every man. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's, that does not narrow it down very much, unfortunately. Uh, okay, and then the next one was... A the, it was a search for a couple reportedly involved in a Christmas time fraud escapade, which they didn't update, and they found the, the woman. Yeah, she like went to various different businesses, buying all kinds of like expensive furniture and jewelry and whatever else, and like one hundred fifty thousand dollar spending spree with fake cashier's checks. And yeah, they found her through the ID that she left at the rental car place. Yeah. And then the last one was about a disappearance of a Florida convenience store worker, which that also had an update where it was this woman who just was abducted and there was no robbery or anything. But the update was just that these two guys finally confessed about her murder. But then there was other women who were like convenience store workers that were being abducted as well. Yeah, she was used as the example for like a series of abductions of 
all all of them were convenience store clerks mm -hmm. in the graveyard shift. So like overnight at like three a.m. is when they're getting kidnapped, basically. And yeah, those two people confessed to hers only. No, not hers. It was oh. one of the other ones. Only. Oh, I thought it was. So hers, hers was still not confessed. Yeah. To so hers and, was the mystery. I don't think her body was ever recovered, but like. You know, the killers led to led them to one of the other ladies. The bodies. other woman, okay. But apparently they didn't necessarily confess to the one that was talked about on the show. Mm, okay. But it could have been the same people. Yeah, but then that's how that ends. And I think that's season four, episode, episode eight? Episode eight, most likely. Yeah. Yeah. So, but IMDb and that, says the ninth episode aired on the sixth, but yeah. whatever. We but got if, the TV guide, so yeah, we're going off the TV guide. <laughs> if you want to watch it, maybe, it's on yeah, Paramount. Maybe, the, maybe this but, station was a week behind the normal yeah, I don't know. <laughs> country. But when we do see Unsolved Mysteries, we always get confused on what the so episode is. they show it like two days a week. They and do. Like, and so That's like what I was like, is this the, the new one or the repeat? I mean, it should say R if it's a repeat. It didn't. It didn't. So. so that's where I am confused. Yeah. Oh, well. But yeah, all the unsolved mysteries are on Amazon Prime. So, okay. After, <laughs> after that was uh, Night Court. And that was a new episode. And uh, after Night Court was Seinfeld, which was the cafe episode. I know you're not into Seinfeld like I am. No. Well, yeah, just saying the cafe episode doesn't mean anything because they're like always in a diner. So. I know. <laughs> this is season three, episode seven, and I think like season three is when everything becomes like all the episodes are like gold to okay. me. I don't know. So the cafe, I don't know if you like really watched a lot of Seinfeld. I've probably seen the episode. But, but it's the episode where George, or not George, uh, Jerry goes in, it's like um, a cafe that's like across the street and it has the character Babu Bot. He's introduced and he's always seeing Babu. He's the new owner of this cafe and he's always trying to lure people in and no one's going in so Jerry feels bad for him mm -hmm. so he's going to the cafe to give him business and then you know he's super and the owner is like super attentive and like oh he's doing things but then he's like overly attentive and then the, the other subplot is that like George is asking Elaine to take an IQ test for him just so he can like uh impress a girl that he's dating mm -hmm. And then after that was a new episode of Quantum Leap, which there is an ad in this, and we'll scan it. Same page as the Unsolved it's Mysteries. The, yeah, it's the same page, so we can just do that. But then this is about... Um, I think I saw this episode, too. It's when Sam, who is Scott Bakula, he leaps into a research chimpanzee in the space program whose life may be in danger if he's not selected as an astro chimp. <laughs> They're rebooting the series. It's coming back soon. <laughs> Some of those episodes make you wonder like how that show got so popular, but I mean this that this was like cutting edge TV <laughs> <laughs> yeah. in the early like him as a monkey, like that's in I don't know, uh, you yeah. haven't seen that. Like yeah. it's inter like it's interesting, <laughs> but it's also like super cheesy. Yeah. I mean, when you watch it now, you're like, mm, okay. Right. But, I mean, back then, you're like, wow, this I've never peak. seen this before. This is the peak of creativity. Yeah. So we'll go on to rankings and ratings. Uh, where on your one to five star scale would you put Enchanted April? Uh, I mean, I'm going to give this a two. Yeah. I was going in between two and three, but... I wish I knew more. And I think three seems generous because, I mean, yeah, there is a lot that seems missing from this. Um, on my zero to four star scale, I'm going to say it's like one and a half. I mean, I didn't hate the movie, but I also just, I just wanted more. I wanted like, it needed I to be I liked all the acting out. and everything. Yeah, yeah, I liked the acting. I liked what bits of characters we got to know, but we never really got to... We were never let into any of their worlds. We are just always outside observers um, looking into little snippets. We never got the full picture. Yeah. 
Uh, every movie's worth watching once. Would you watch it again? If this was, like, remade, maybe with the same actresses? I don't know. <laughs> It'd be tough to yeah. get the same actresses I know. years later. Yeah, because I know at Especially, least yeah. Mrs. Fisher is, like, 90 years old now. But yeah, she's she stopped acting. Um, I don't... <laughs> Or if this was, like, remade into, like, a three- or four-part series, like, on, right. like, BBC or something, then, yeah. But, I mean, yeah, I would watch this again. I don't hate it. Yeah, I mean, there's other things I would watch first, by far. I mean, I don't know. Again, I'd be watching it more for the scenery, and the scenery wasn't even all that great. I, I'm i with you. If there's, like, a remake of this... I'd be interested to see what they do with the remake. I'd love to see what the 1935 movie looks like, honestly, too. Yeah. Um, but this one, I don't know. I'm good. I don't need to. I don't need to. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, if you out there want to watch Enchanted April, as of this recording in March 2022, it's available on Pluto TV, digital rental, VHS, and DVD. As always, check your local listings. You can find us on all of your major podcasting platforms. Please remember to rate, review, subscribe, and tell your friends. It does help us out a lot. You can email us at 1991movierewind at gmail.com. Follow us on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and Letterboxd. Just search 1991movierewind or go to 1991movierewind.com for the full list of movies along with show notes and more. Uh, next week, since we are in spring, we're going to be watching a movie called Dead Silence, or better known as A Death in Palm Springs. That's only available on YouTube, <laughs> so we will see you then. Thanks. <laughs>